Okay. Hello, my name is Paul Sevilla, and I'm a librarian for the Livermore Public Library. Welcome to this evening's program, College on the Autism Spectrum, a parent's guide to students' mental health and well-being with Dr. Lori Leventhal Belfer. Before we begin, I would like to mention that tonight's program is part of Livermore Reads Together, celebrating the book, The Reason I Jump, The Inner Voice of a 13-Year-Old Boy with Autism by Naoki Higashida. I encourage attendees to type their questions in the chat box for the Q&A portion of this program. And now I'm delighted to introduce our special guest. Dr. Lori is a clinical psychologist, adjunct lecturer at Stanford University in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, School of Medicine. She is also an author, a speaker, and advocate. She works with children, adolescents, and young adults with anxiety disorders, medical issues, stress, and high-functioning autism spectrum disorders. Lastly, she is on the board of directors of Stanford Medical Alliance Inclusion, Disability, and Equity. Her website is www.drleventhalbelfer.com. Dr. Lori, welcome and thank you for joining us. Paul, thank you very much for inviting me. I look forward to the opportunities to be able to have, especially on with Zoom, to be able to reach people all over the country and internationally. As you can notice, when I wrote this the second time with its first goals, I changed the title a little bit because I think it's important to know what I'm talking about with kids on the autism spectrum applies with parents of teams with mental health issues, learning and developmental challenges, because all of you are going to be looking for ways to help your child make the transition to college, be better prepared and to get services. Congratulations. You would not be this far if you hadn't helped your children so much to be advocates for them. I talk a lot about in my earlier books, the journey you've traveled, the disbelief that this diagnosis could be your child, the shock, and then the wish I could do everything I possibly can so they'll be fine by the time they're three or five. And now I'm seeing people not being diagnosed till they're in graduate school. So heads off to you for doing this hard work and getting this far. One of the things we'll be speaking about in the talk is that important role to remember when they go to college, they will be adults and you will not be there to help them with their homework, to be their advocate. You can be their support at home, but they're going to have to know how to navigate that school and disability services on their own. What are some of the new challenges? First, not all colleges, as you I'm sure you wear, are high schools or middle schools or elementary schools understand autism spectrum disorder. There was huge debates in my profession. Should we put that label together because it fits such a wide range of kids? So when I started this working with this population, when I was an intern at Stanford Children's Hospital, that's when there was PDDNOS, that was when, when there was autism and the beginning of Asperger's disorder. Um, as I work more in the field with people with disabilities, I've learned very carefully not to label anyone as fitting into one lump and some, and to look for their individual strengths and challenges. So tonight we'll be talking about preparing you and your child and supporting them from afar. My background, I'm a psychologist, as he, as he said, adjunct lecturer at Stanford University. I feel passionate about a systems approach to understanding and supporting kids. And what I mean by that is nobody develops and grows in isolation. So my early work in working with children with, who were born premature, working with children, long-term survivors of childhood cancer, and working with inner city project, complex projects at the University of Chicago, Harvard Medical School, and Hopkins, was that you cannot look at a child in isolation. 
You must look at them in the context of their family, of their community, about the values and the beliefs and looking at race and diversity issues that they have encountered, as well as looking at the attitudes people have about what your child's issues are and how you feel about them as parents. In the book that I'm talking about today, I have stayed connected with these parents at times of success, of roadblocks. I get wedding pictures, I get graduation pictures, and I get pit photos of new babies. So it shows my age. I'm the author of four books, including College on the Autism Spectrum, which you can see on my website, and I'm the founder of the Friends Program. The Friends Program was designed when I was a pre-doc uh, or start post-doc, and I was asked to identify these kids who everybody thought had ADHD. At the same time, Asperger's was just coming out with a colleague of mine, Fred Volkmore from Yale. And these kids were different. They weren't necessarily troublemakers, but the schools were told that if you don't get evaluated, they will be kicked out from daycare. Parents those days had a tet felt that if I came to observe or any mental health professional observed their children, that would be something that would hold their kid back. What they couldn't see is if they didn't get help, their child would be kicked out. So I realized seeing them one-on-one -on -one was not seeing the system. They would say, Dr. Lori, have you invested in the stock market today? But if I asked another question, they couldn't say anything. We would set up play systems because my background was normal development. And he said, these two dinosaurs can't play together. One of them is a vegetarian and the other eats carnivorous. They don't talk. Um, so they had many reasons why playing on the ground like neurotypical kids would play was not working for them. And then, of course, I began to realize I need to see them with peers, not just with adults. So I created the Friends Program, which was designed to look just like a typical preschool room. I had speech and language, I had OT, and I had psychiatry fellows who I was supervising. And we created it to fit like a typical day where they had transitions, they had to go outside, they had to come back, they had to work together. And what I saw in that first group was a group of children who everything had to be perfect. Every block had to be set and the parents were in the observation room. They could say, John is gonna have a blow up if someone puts the wrong color block. I had other kids who were running around the room saying, let's go do this, or I see gold, or let's find this, but they never stayed long enough for anyone to join them. And another child who was making a fire, pretending to make a fire and covering it up and making a fire and covering up. That grandmother was in the observation room and she said he has observed a fire um, and that's where he had trauma and needed an individual therapist. The kid running around the room all the time had ADHD and there were groups for kids with ADHD. But at that time, there was no groups for kids with high functioning autism spectrum disorder. In fact, that diagnosis didn't exist at the time and they were more of the group of kids with Asperger's who had lots of ideas, who fit the stereotype of the little professor, but had tremendous difficulty talking or playing with their peers. When I look at children, when I work with adults with disabilities, when I, any type of research I do, I take a systems approach. And when I say talking a systems approach, as I said earlier, I do not believe we can understand people in isolation. So in this diagram, first we have the student. It's important to know and work with the family, parents and siblings, how they view that child, the support that they give them, or their role as advocates. Next, what is their social network like? One of the most difficult things I'm seeing in the high school students I'm seeing now is that they do not have friends. COVID has hit everyone hard when it becomes developing friendships and maintaining them. But many of the clients I see are too scared they'll be rejected. Or they don't like exactly everything that they do or animal rights, they wear leather so I can't be friends with them. Are they involved in activities at their church, at synagogue, Boy Scouts? Do they have a way they are socially with other people, even though they may not be good friends? Do they belong to a club at school or the community? 
and do they get support through the religion, religious organizations? Next, I look at medical and mental health issues. Are there well-being programs involved? What is their health condition? Are they having medical conditions that are often associated with autism? And lastly, how do you see their role in the community, in internships? Have they gone to sleepaway camp? Have they been involved in any volunteer programs? And how do they feel about going to college? So this is, I'm sure, familiar to all of you. This is that roller coaster kids go through. And for kids on the spectrum, it's throughout life. We find like, you know, what's happening is a preschool, you find a kidney garden that looks like things are going okay. The teachers may change, they get adjusted, and then whoops, you've got middle school. The same process begins again when they go to high school, and I swear it will happen again in college and graduate school. Um, Piaget calls that as we get into new things, we learn to assimilate, then we have that disequilibrium where things go up and down like this roller coaster and then we find ways and networks to help us adjust so one of the first comics i don't know if you can see it there just let me die this is a photo of someone going to college what am i doing am i feeling better yes i'm finally fit, feeling productive wait oh, i'm sick of this i still have more homework and tests are coming up please finish me and that will be repeated numerous times. What's the college? College can be overwhelming to all students. And what we're seeing in current research, kids from, who are from an ethnic minority, kids with disabilities, kids with a medical background, and kids who have been getting a tremendous amount of support from parents or teachers or private advisors, and uh, tutors at home. But I just reviewed a new study of, of kids going to college and what it feels like to be the minority along any of those variables. And I think the girls sitting down, I don't want to get another text message, have I done my work, or a reminder what I have to do, and I'm overwhelmed with how much I'm supposed to be reading tonight. And I especially see this with students with dyslexia. What's college support and diagnosis? What is really, if you take away with anything from this talk tonight, is to remember support or disability services often require a diagnosis. I can't tell you how many times I've seen families who have never shared the child's diagnosis and their seniors in high school. That person is not gonna be an advocate to get services without being ex having experience understanding it. And in my friend's program, now the requirement is everyone must have been diagnosed. And by middle school, I strongly encourage parents to talk about the disability. I can't tell you how many times kids know by looking at the bookshelves or looking at the books next to the parent's bed or seeing the kinds of groups that they're going to or they're getting services at school. Just as parents may be resistant to diagnosis, so may your children. This is that look we often see as students. I can't tell you how many times when I'm teaching medical students, they have their laptop up and I don't even see their face. This is sort of the classic um, model in like a law school where you can't have a computer up and you have to look. And I'm wondering, what is he actually thinking of? Many of the students I see on the autism spectrum, I have them draw a picture of their head. And in it, on the side, I say, what are things you think about all day? It may be various YouTubes. It may be a favorite movie. It may be a series of books, or like a teen I saw today, climate change issues. Um, it may be issues of gender um, diversity and also the issue of ethnicity and what's happening in politics. But what's often left out is friends and schoolwork. Welcome to college, understanding your new role, the first day of school. Don't let me, don't leave me here. 
I think another way of saying it, it's the first day of college now and parents don't want you to don't want their kids to leave. Every college that I went to years ago when my children started college was a lecture about being the um, helicopter parent. And now I say that to families whose kids are in elementary, middle and high school. You will not be able to see all of their homework. You will not be able to help them with all of their work when they go to college. In almost every college I've worked at or seen, they have a series of talks to parents to please let us help your child and you're their social support. That's a very hard transition to start their senior year. And I strongly recommend it beginning by the end of middle school because it's hard to let go. Both of my kids, when they went to college, were shocked by how many girls especially would walk up and down the steps and text with the mom several times between classes. And these were neurotypical kids. But it's very hard if someone's getting support elsewhere to go to the teacher and ask for that help. And that's what they're going to need to do as adults. Welcome to college understanding your new role, first meeting your adult child or viewing them for the first time as an adult. As for adults with HIPAA rules, I'm sure you're aware, as I, psychologists, staff of hospitals, the university professors, the people at the student health center may not talk to you once your child is an adult without having your child's written consent. I just got a call yesterday from someone who has a um, child who's a freshman and crashing at Stanford. And I had to remind them, I cannot talk to your child without them filling out the adult consent forms and giving me permission to talk to them and to the parents. Privacy is the same issue. And I'll talk about there are times in my book goes over where you can see their academic records only and long distance challenges, time changes when you're going to talk, when you're going to get a hold of, and teachers can only talk with you if it is strictly about an academic grade. And then they still should have your students, their students and your child's consent. Helping your student understand their needs. And this is, I know, is a very challenging role as a parent. How are they on executive functioning? Like day-to-day -day planning. Can they get up if they're taking medicine? Do they take their medicine? Do they get dressed on their own, have breakfast on their own? Uh, is their backpack have what they need to go to school? Do they turn in their homework? <laughs> um, and do they know about when things are due? Because uh, in college, you won't be there to help organize that. Uh, and many, I can't tell you how many high school students I try to have them put reminders on their iPhones like I have and I point out that I have all of my appointments and activities on it and they say, ah, no one does that Dr. Laurie anymore. So I say, how do you see yourself doing it? They're not sure. Communications. It's very important that your children feel that they can talk to you about when they are in distress when they feel overwhelmed and that you encourage them at this age to talk to their teacher or talk to a counselor if they need support. For all students these days, I just gave a talk to a middle school, one in five teens and young adults have a significant number of the diagnosis or characteristics of anxiety disorders and one in four have depression. So these are for all kids, not just kids on the autism spectrum. So communication is essential. The next area is life management. Can they do their own laundry? How are they in choosing what they're gonna eat? Grooming and arranging their appointment. Uh, when I see kids by the time they're sophomores, I want them to text me and I want them to tell me that they can't make an appointment because you will not be there in college to do it for them. Lastly, their mental health issues. 
we see very high comorbidity with these kids in depression, anxiety, and ADHD. And that is a switch with the DSM-5. It used to be you could only have one diagnosis. We realized that was not capturing these kids. Um, and so now you can have multiple diagnoses, which helps getting disability services and also getting services. But most of the kids that I am seeing now who are say 10 or elementary to middle school had been misdiagnosed by having ADHD and anxiety and the clinician had not picked up autism spectrum disorder because they were so high functioning. So these are some college support checklists for you to think about your teen. Does he or she, do they have a tutor? Do they see a therapist? Can they manage their own schedule? Have they made new friends in high school? Have they maintained those friendships? Are they able to manage their medications? How are they about cooking and cleaning up after themselves? And have they started to have experience managing their money? It's very overwhelming to start it at college. And my advice is always you start with very small amounts rather than expecting them to do all of it um, till they begin to feel more confident. And if they live in the same city, you can help them open up an account there. Um, many of these kids get scanned when they go to colleges and many colleges are used to doing that. They get the really beautiful page of paper. It has the same color, the same heading as a bank and someone else asks for their confidential information. So it's crucial that they know not to give that private information online. Here's some questions about what you do currently with them. Do you help them wake up? Do you prepare their breakfast? Do you drive them to school? Do you provide deadline reminders? Do you help with deadline crisis? All right, I'll write that section for you while you do this. Go take a shower, you're falling asleep and I will finish this part and or I'll put your references on. Do you try to communicate on their behalf? And are you managing their calendar and their social world? None of which you'll be able to do when they go to college. The importance of ongoing communication. I can't tell you how important it was that students were able to, in my book, I talk about specific cases, were able to call to a parent and say, I'm scared, I'm overwhelmed. I've had students who were um, very depressed and luckily that parent was able to get there and just go for a walk. Your job is not to be the therapist. Your job is not to get them to the hospital immediately. It's to say, I'm here to support you and to be their advocate. And you can do it. I've had my kids, you know, I started out on the East Coast and both of our kids are back on the East Coast. So I know what it's like with time changes. Before college, how socially and emotionally are prepared? Have, it's important to have regular discussions on how your child can manage stress and with their therapist, if they're currently seeing a therapist, loneliness, which everyone experiences at college, anxiety, and depression and to know what sets us off for them. Are they feeling overwhelmed by homework? Are they have a fear? I've seen students and we'll talk about cases who were worried that if other people knew the diagnosis, they would be ostracized or bullied. How able are they to socialize and make new friends? We can all think back and share with them what it was like to have our first college roommate. And I can say my first college roommate was from New York. I was from the Midwest. And when she called me because there were no computers then, I could not understand a word she said. I worked in national parks. I had jeans and turtlenecks. She came with uh, pantsuits. So we were dramatically different, became best friends. How do they handle bullying? Can they tell when someone just is saying they want to be a friend, but they videotape them? and know the difference. What's the value they played of different perspectives rather than making quick judgments 
which many of my clients did with college. I hate their music, I hate them. If they won't follow every rule, I think someone has to follow on climate change issues or animal rights, I don't wanna talk with them. Because you can't pick who your roommate is. And sometimes they can if they have disabilities, get an individual room, but you're still going to be in classes, still be in the hall with people with different values and perspectives than you have. How well are they in avoiding risky behavior such as drinking, drugs, and sex? And how well prepared are they how to know how to handle those things, which will be accessible and available at every college dorm and any frat? And how well are they able to practice self-advocacy? And I would underline that over and over again, because you can be their support, but you will not be able to be their advocate when they go to college or when they are adults, even if they're living at home and going to community college, if they're 18, they must do it themselves. What are some of the common mental health disorders that I've been seeing with the children that, and teens and young adults that I work with? ADHD it, is very common. Anxiety disorders. Um, I'm afraid of germs. I'm scared of getting COVID. I'm worried that I'm not safe and I have to make sure every door is locked. I'm anxious that if I try anything new, I will fail. I'm not gonna try out for the soccer team because I know I won't make it rather than trying. Depression and suicidal ideation on the teens and children I've seen on the spectrum. Often I'll hear them say when they're very angry, I'm so mad I wanna kill myself. But then I take a deep breath and I ask, do you have a plan? What would you do? And usually they never have a plan. Many times these kids say that, which means I'm really mad and I'm furious that I can't go out with my friends or play this game and I have to stay in and do this homework. So it's important to know the difference and when they are feeling, who do they contact at school for help? Also, some of the things I spoke about earlier were obsessive compulsive disorders, meaning like fear of germs, fear of getting sick, um, also their anxiety that cuts very high about, um, I'm seeing kids who are traveling and having to get shots or vaccines. And then there's obsessive compulsive related disorders, but don't meet the full criteria. One of the questions is, that I often bring up when talking with peers is what's the difference between not being able to stop thinking about this issue that's very important to them and it being obsessive compulsive. Ticks is often something we also see, and very rarely schizophrenia. Support or disability services. Many schools will not let you apply till after the student has been accepted. So parents fear that if they disclose their disability, that will prevent them from getting in it is a misbelief because they are not allowed to even look at that material until the student is accepted. Currently, I've had several students who wrote a very short um, essay about how having autism helped them better understand the social world, become a better student and advocate. So I think it's not, wasn't their major essay, but I felt very good that they were comfortable enough saying that. Again, as I've said throughout the talk tonight, students have full responsibility for initiating and following through with academic and mental health services. Some schools are more progressive and let you enroll in that earlier. And I must say, when my daughter went to college, I was thrilled that they had a form asked, letting you know ahead of time, they're gonna ask your child permission to talk to you if they are seriously concerned about academic or mental health issues. Not if you have a D, not if you've missed a class, or not if you're at a party late at night. But if something was really significant, would they give you permission to talk? And I think that's the best a school can do because it is preventive. 
How can you foster your child's transition? First, acknowledge your new role. You're no longer their main teacher, their main supervisor, their only advocate. You are helping them understand their new role is becoming an adult who is independent and will be going to school and having to be an advocate for themselves. Foster their independence before they go to college. Let them meet a friend for tea or go to a friend's house without giving details of everything that they're doing and what time they're going to be home because you won't know that when they're in college. Find a communication style that works for both of you where it's not, they don't feel cross-examined, they don't feel that you doubt them um, or you do not trust them because if they feel that way, they're not going to talk. Accept that the goals may differ from yours. Their goals may differ. Your goals may be their grade point average and knowing ahead of time what they're going to do for graduate school. Their goal may be making it through the first three months of college. Be open to finding the right college. And I see so many people say it should be your individual choices. Sometimes it's the college a friend is going to, sometimes it's something that they came across and they want. But again, knowing that they have their own disabilities, what are the right colleges to provide that support built in? And many times you have to apply separately to such colleges. But to think about how much support do they have now and how much will they need, do you think, when they go to college? The nice thing of qualifying for disability services, you don't have to use it. So one of the students I'll be talking about later qualified, but he basically became friends with the administrative director there more than using any of the services at the school. Finding the right fit. That's very hard and we can all look back thinking that would have been the perfect preschool. I wish my child went to that preschool, but they were happy where they're at and that's what counts. And when you start at one college does not mean you have to finish at the same college. Um, and many times students will want to take a year off and we'll talk about that later. I often advocate for applying and then you can still take a year off rather than having them to have to apply later. This dance shoes will remind me of a case I'll be talking about where the girl wanted to be a dancer. The grandmother wanted her to be a nurse and the mom was torn because they were so close how she would handle any of these moves when we're living independently. Selecting a university. There's web searches in my book, which I talk about by interest and by concern, best the values of care. Know the range of services a school provides and think about how much services and support are your children getting now. Are services peer support or mental health services? And you also can do a study, do a Google Scholar search or Google search to see how available are these services. Many of the studies talk about having services, but it could be months before you can see somebody. How much support and training has a faculty and the administration had about children with or students with disabilities? I am still working on this issue at Stanford right now. And currently they have very minimal support. If you go to a special program that I have outlined in my book, it will talk about the role they play in educating faculty and administration in understanding both your students, the student's strength and challenges and how they can make school work smoother for them and for the students and for their peers. What about a special program within the school? I think those are great because you have that built-in support, helping them with daily organization, helping them become advocates. But again, at this age, they are going to have to be the one who utilizes those services. They also provide a strong source of support, peer support, as well as they can help communicate with teachers who have very or little no, or training in this field. They also gives you an opportunity to talk to other parents and students when looking at these schools. In summary, 
when looking at these issues, I think it's very important to assess your child's strengths and challenges. Every child has both, every adult has both. Diagnosis to me is critical for securing services. Keep talking or texting. Communication is critical, but don't ask for cross-examining about how are they feeling that day? How did they do on their test? How are their grades? Just thinking about you, hope, you, hope it's not too cold or hope you're having a beautiful day, depending where they go. Have resources identified before they're needed and get additional support is linked to success, not for holding a child back. This is a book, College on the Autism Spectrum. And in my book, I have case vignettes of talking about students who often held back their diagnosis in fear that they would be labeled or identified <clears throat> or those who disclosed and let the school share the diagnosis with the parents, but then they refused services because they felt they didn't need anything. And one child who became Vala Victorian, but he was the child whose first year had suicidal ideation. So most of the students have made it through with bumps along the way, but what's most important is that they became able to recognize their need for support and I interviewed them when they went to college and also got follow up. <clears throat> and I interviewed the parents of how they were doing at college. So I know that's fast. I'm sure there'll be questions along the way. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lori. Um, type in your questions in the chat. We do have a couple of questions here already. Um, one question I see is, what are your tips for handling stress and anxiety? Um, I dance every day. <laughs> As I tell people, uh, exercise to me, it's very individualized, is crucial. Yoga, um, when I was an intern, I danced my whole life. And when I was an intern, I told my supervisor, I'm sorry, I can't go two days a week. And she said, no problem, Lori, I go five days a week. I knew that she was not a dancer. She saw a therapist. <laughs> so, you know, I think you find ways to put that in. And most colleges are providing yoga, meditation, dance. Um, and for some people it's music, but the more that they can do with others, I think is always better. Um, and I think for your child, they're gonna have to find their individual way that helps them the most. Some being in a band, some being in doing, um, working with robots, uh, and be able to have some kind of activity they can do with other people, going walking. I know Stanford has a walking group. They have dance groups. They have meditation groups. Being with others, I think, is really important when you're feeling stressed and anxious in realizing you're not alone. And are there uh, campus organizations uh, uh, especially for um, um, students on the on the autism autism spectrum, there are certain programs, and those are those that I've talked about in my book that have programs specifically for students on the autism spectrum, and they provide often peer support where another student and the core ones that have it built in where you apply separately, they do have ongoing support groups. The groups that I work with at Stanford, we just changed the name to SMATI because of the sense of using the word abilities is often viewed by people with disabilities as, as disclaiming their disability or not acknowledging it. So it stands for Stanford Medical Advocacy, Inclusion, Disabilities, um, as well as for looking at for um, ethnicity and looking for equity. So I think is that you can look on the individual campuses um, for these different organizations, but basically student mental health all over are looking at well-being programs, which are good, but one of my concerns is all online. <laughs> and to me, there's nothing like having someone to have coffee with or go for a walk with, or someone who has that shared view. We also, I've worked with many students who have gender fluidity, which is very common for students these days, as well as looking at issues in diversity. 
um, and finding people with that similar group is very important. And many parents, especially our children, feel that uncomfortable sharing that with you. I think it's always better if they can share it before they go to college rather than when they're at college. Another question, Another question from Sam. Um, some students are afraid or uncomfortable to ask for assistance or special accommodations because yep. they don't want their peers to think that they're getting special treatment. Absolutely. And that's where I think it's important for them to realize or to begin to talk. And it depends how, Sam, how old is your, your child? Uh, Sam? Um... You know, if they're in freshman or if they're in medical school, the earlier you can have them have that experience. And what I've often done with my clients is look to your right and to your left. Uh, many people get services and you don't know that. It's usually confidential. And even in elementary school, when parents are petrified of sharing it, kids get pulled out. So do you don't even know they're getting those services. Um, and I'll remember when my son was in freshman in high school, there was a girl in her cl his class who was blind and they thought nothing about helping her where to stand when she sang with a choir. So I think kids adapt to it much better often than adults. And I think the earlier they can be open about it. I understand when it's a mental health issue, they get scared of that stigma. And many of the students in my book, it's based on filled with narratives talked about, I don't want to be bullied or what happened is many of them, when they began to share it, other people said, that can't be you, you're too high functioning. So you get the the you get the it feels strong enough to be able to say I am having the autistic spectrum disorder and they say no way you can't be that way you're too smart so it hits them that I can't share that information um, and I think also is to be able to have the advantage of going to disability services they often have online groups and support groups their biggest fear is that those people will be the low functioning. And rather than seeing you can, you know, this, they have their own stereotypes. But as I say to students, it's always better to ask for support and then navigate how much you need. And it varies school to school. In some schools, you must go to the school and you must go to the teacher and let them know. Unlike in high school or middle school, where the counselor would let them know, it's up to you to let them know. But I think it's important to remember the um, the disabilities rights uh, associated ADR and many schools don't even acknowledge that it exists. Of course, they must follow the disability rights um, and that is national. It's federal. It's not city by city or state by state. And following that reminding about that, I'm working with Stanford medical students on that same issue. So that's important to educate your kid also about. Is there a resource that provides a list of clinical psychologists that specialize in supporting students in the autism spectrum in Northern California? Um, I think that basically, um, Marianne, is <clears throat> if you go to um, California Autism Speaks, they have a list of resources. Parents Helping Parents has a list of people. And then you also can go to your school district and they often have referrals and go to the, your pediatrician depending on where they are, if they're still seeing a pediatrician and they will have resources also. Um, one of the hardest things right now is that they are all so filled. Um, and there can be six, when I'm getting somebody is evaluated to eight months. I have kids who have gone, been sent away or coming back um, in the fall, you know, and um, people basically have can have years waits. So it's better to get the resources now that you if you can and start now. Um, and one of the issues also is if your child is going to college in California, they can still work with their therapist from California. I have had clients who are back east uh, in the Midwest for colleges. So I have to work on trying to help find 
therapist for them and I get I'm in a network where I get calls all the time does anyone know anyone in Chicago does anyone know anyone in Detroit or different cities where they're going to be living in but you can also go to the colleges your child is interested or to the advocate who's helping them look under disability services look at student mental health services I can say when I tried to get one of my clients help at UC Berkeley there was no one at student mental health, student health care who had expertise in the field. Then I went to the faculty who I have went to Berkeley and got my doctorate. I have taught at, at Berkeley um, and they could not think of anybody on campus. So it's really important to research those resources ahead of time, but they didn't have established programs. UCSF had a program. And this one child who wanted to basically come to see me and drive here to Palo Alto from Berkeley, which was Meshuggah crazy. <laughs> that would just, they would be taking way too long to do that. Um, so if they're in California, you can have virtual conversations. And one of my clients reconnected to the person who they saw in high school in LA and could have virtual conversations. But it's nice if you can get someone at school because they can help you with advocacy. But in my book, I list in my bibliography, tons of resources. I also list counselors to, you can seek for getting individual supports um, with knowledge about working with different kids, uh, kids who don't fit into the box. Um, and then I think that along the way, it, when you look at the schools ahead of time, I always recommend looking at disabilities services how easy, how, what does it have to go through for them to apply to them and the kind of resources they have available. I can get a top-notch Ivy League school, supposedly top-notch, and they don't men mention autism, even though I've had students from MIT and students from Harvard. So I know they go there, but they don't list it. So that to me is a red flag. And that I and then I do what I do is I go ahead and do the search under their areas and do they have that? So again, that's where we're really working on being having it being more vocal and being more visible. Thank you, Doctor, for that. Uh, uh, a couple more questions. Uh, one from Sam. Uh, do you have any recommendations about colleges with good track records? for helping, assisting autistic students? Yes, if you go in my book, I list three schools that I think are perfect. Um, again, it may not be for what you want or for your kids, but when you go to those schools, you will see resources. And they also have, um, there's this whole list of uh, affordable programs, but that what I like about those programs is they have built-in resources for you, meaning that your child applies to that program and in it they have a list of services for the kids to go to. And you want, depending on your child, I don't know your child, Sam, or the student, but if they are currently are taking regular classes, then to me, I think it's really important to have that kind of support built in for executive functioning, social support, connections to mental health, organizational, which is ex executive functioning, as well as peer support socially to help them navigate the college campus, navigate activities and clubs to go to. And it's built in. The, the advantage of it, they take all regular classes. If you have a child who needs special education, that's another type of track to look into. The tricky part that I find many parents in the beginning want the kids to live at home and go to community college. But especially during COVID, my clients who have, and some who have done great, but many have had tremendous difficulty connecting socially because everything is online. There's nothing like having to have the social world with your roommate <laughs> or the people who are living on the hall or when you have, who's having lunch together. Um, so that's why the more of those social activities you can have as well as someone at the school to go to when you're feeling overwhelmed um, or, or an RA to talk to about those things. But the ones who have been working from home have had more difficulty connecting. And uh, is it 
another question here is if, if my child is nonverbal, are there services that can assist uh, assist my child in, in college? Is it? Yeah, go ahead. Is this the student who basically communicates through the computer? Then I would look at parents um, helping the parents in one of the websites that I list in my book about autism and autism speaks has that also college is a list of different schools for those kids who need to have that type of equipment available. Um, so I wouldn't make any generalization as I think you correct are correct not to do that and to ask for that. Also, it, I think it's really helpful to see if they have a parent support group there that you can contact and how available are these resources. In some of the studies I reviewed, they talked about, you know, so many nurses and doctors, uh, mental health people, but you really want to know computer access and can they take it with them and can they and also can it be used for when they take tests. Um, disability services should provide that. But when you go to look at a college, look at disability services, see what they list, and if it doesn't have what your son or daughter needs, call them, write them. You can't, they cannot be specific with you about your child until your child is accepted. Any other questions? Okay, well, once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Lori. For, for giving this informative presentation. We're so grateful to have the opportunity to, to, to speak with you. And I know that uh, this, this video will be available on the library's YouTube channel. So more people will be able to, to watch and benefit from your presentation. Um, so again, thank you. And please join us for our other Livermore Reads Together events at the Livermore Public Library. Uh, we're going to have, uh, this Saturday, we're going to have a talk that focuses on a job search and job search strategies and advice for adults with autism and other learning and mental health differences. And uh, on Monday, March 21st at 7 p.m., we're going to have a, an inspiring talk with uh, Temple Grandin herself. So don't miss that. Uh, for more information, go ahead, Dr. Lori. No, I, say, I also would look at, I work at Stanford, the Neurodiversity Program. They have a big program for, it's very hard, they're only serving Stanford students now, but they do have symposiums and websites about colleges as well as symposiums on job opportunities. So I would look there also. And also the California Organization for Autism speaks. All right, so that's the Neurodiversity Program at Stanford University and Autism Speaks. A California program of oh. autism. California program, okay, of well, Autism Speaks, okay. And you know, I think you can get my book at the library, so I'm not yes. trying to sell it. And you definitely can Xerox all the references I've listed and vaguely talked about, as well as it talks about the different diagnoses and types of services that are available. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lori. For more right. information about Livermore Reads Together and our other programs, visit livermorelibrary.net or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Lori. Thank you to our attendees and have a great rest of the evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>